Okay. So looking more closely at the turbine wheel and the turbine disc assembly, um, or turbine disc and wheel assembly, um, if it is a multi-component assembly, meaning we have an individual uh, disc and then the blades are attached to it, when the blades are installed, we want to make sure that they're installed in a way that there is some play, but then we need to retain them. Right? So there needs to be some movement with the blades, but they have to be able to be retained. So the most common attachment method is called the fir tree root. Fir tree root. You're like, what kind of term is that? Well, fir is a type of pine tree, yeah? So think of a Christmas tree. Okay? Now, if I take a Christmas tree and I look at the shape, it's a big triangle. And it's got little branches that kind of stick out on the side. So if I take a Christmas tree and flip it upside down, that's what the root of the blade looks like here. So this is the blade. The blade is like a plant is buried in the ground, right? So this would be the root. The root looks like an upside down fir tree. So it's referred to as fir tree root attachment. So the blade just slid into a groove. And when they sit in that groove, they wiggle and they can move around. Now to keep them in that groove, they'll put a rivet and they drive a rivet. So you thought riveting was only for airframes, yeah? It's not. Okay. You rivet the blades onto the disc. You think it's going to be an AD, yada, yada, you know, whatever the rivet numbers are, I forget, MS2470, whatever, whatever. No. It's going to be a very specific rivet, probably made of high temp alloy. You're probably going to have to heat that rivet to red hot temperature and slide it in there and drive it while it's hot in order to be able to do it without work hardening it or cracking it. So it's going to be a very specific operation um, that's done at an engine shop. Okay, it's not just driving rivets like you would on an airframe. But it's still a rivet nonetheless. Yes? Isn't the, uh, the bottom of the blade thick? Is that how when we're uh, driving the rivet from the bottom, right? Yeah. Well, you're driving it. So if you look, this is the rivet. So the rivet's going to be from either side. It's going across... It's axially. You orient the, orient the rivet axially. So it's a long axial. Uh, well, you know, half inch maybe, depending on the blade. So another way is when they attach them, they have a little clip, and the blade will slide into the disc, and you'll push a little clip in place, and it's kind of like a spring clip. Okay. A lot of times they'll just call them locking tabs. A more kind of not used anymore is to weld it in place. Well, we know the problem with welding is it doesn't allow movement of the parts. And the weld material itself is going to heat up at a different rate than the base metal. So that's not used very often at all. What is peening? P-E-E-N. What's peening? We need movement of the blade because it's going to expand thermally. And there's two parts. If they're tight together when it's cold, when it heats up, they're going to seize and they're going to crack. So you have to have movement of that turbine, um, turbine blade in the hub itself or in the, the disc. It's a little bit of a uh, little bit of tolerance in there. Yeah, when you move them around. If you go up to out to an airport and there's an airplane parked and it's a turbine airplane. And the wind's blowing. Yeah, you'll sit there and you'll watch the rotor spin and you'll hear ding, 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 click, 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 ding, 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 click, 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 click. It's all the blades moving and bouncing around. They're all loose. Okay. But back to the first question here. What is peening? P-E-E-N. Everyone, everyone ever heard of a ball peen hammer? Okay, the ball peen hammer, the ball peen is a rounded part of the hammer. If you hit something, it puts a big dent in it. That's what peening is, is it'll actually put a big dent in the blade to expand it to kind of get it stuck in that hole. So these are really the old system. It's going to be peening and welding. Currently, we only use lock tabs and riveting. Froze. Oops, here we Okay, so look at this image and take a look at this blade. Notice at the tip of the blade, it's kind of exaggerated on its curve, but notice that the tips of all these blades 
are just kind of opened, right? There, there's nothing attached to them. Compared to this blade, notice that it's installed in, there's the fir tree root, it's slid in, there's the rivet that you'll slide in and, and then drive that rivet. But look at the blade itself. It's wide and it has like a flange on the top. They call that a shrouded turban. So what happens is when you put in one blade and then you set another blade next to it, not only do the blades interconnect at the, at the disc, they interconnect out at the very top. So when it's all said and done, it'll make a ring out of a bunch of different segments. And then that ring makes an aerodynamic seal. Okay. So one thing about this design is that you're going to have less uh, pressure loss at the tip because it's a sealed tip, but then you're going to have to spin the blade at a lower RPM because it has more mass at the tip, so centrifugal force goes up. Right? So you might see this on a lower RPM engine, but it's a little bit more efficient, extracts more power. So maybe in the power turbines of a turboprop, you might expect to see a shrouded turbine. So a lot of these blades, when they're manufactured, they're precision cast. It's just a, a process of taking molten metal and putting it into a mold, and then it expands the mold because it's liquid, and then when it solidifies, it becomes a hardened part. And then they'll take it and they'll grind it and finish it and machine it to get the final shape. Castings are generally not as strong as, let's say, a forging. A forging is when we take a metal that's been softened and we hammer it into shape. But it's very difficult to, to forge some of these uh, very detailed uh, profiles. So uh, casting happens a lot. And when they do this, they cast it as a single crystal. That sounds kind of interesting. And this is what I was talking to you about, where um, they actually take this, this metal, and instead of turning it into a liquid, they turn it into a plasma. And then it kind of grows into the shape. Um, most of the blades will have some type of coating on them. Like, well, what do you mean coating? Is it paint? No. It's something that's, that's kind of shot on with a plasma spray. We need to go to YouTube for a second so we can see this process. So, Yes. Let's watch this one. They, they machine, but they have to start with a casting first. And then they'll machine the final portions of it. One thermal spraying process is plasma spray. Masking defines the areas to be coated. So that the particles to be applied adhere to the component, it is cleaned first. In this surface coating method, powder particles are injected into hot plasma and thereby melted and hit the surface of the component at speeds of up to 450 meters a second. There, they form a material layer that fulfills the requisite characteristics for its function, for example, as wear protection. Online diagnostics ensure that the quality of the results remain at a uniformly high level. Without these surface coatings, modern engines would be unable to supply either the necessary performance over the long term or the necessary service lives. So I didn't really go in depth in the process, but you see how they're using that very high temperature um, in that case, it was some type of a flame. And they put the, the material, whatever the substance is, maybe some type of titanium powder or something, they'll put it in there and they'll kind of shoot it onto the blade. And that makes a really strong coating. A lot of times it's a ceramic material. Um, and so what it does is it protects the metal from, from erosion, from hot gases. It helps the metal handle temperature fluctuations better. So that means that when you're doing inspections on these blades and you pull out a turbine wheel, you have to look for what they call coating loss. 
right? And you'll look at it, and it'll be like a very small color change in an area. It almost looks like it flaked, like something has peeled off. Coating loss, and you're going to have to end up rejecting the blade because it no longer has that protective coating. Um, but you'll see this on a lot of turbine wheels and turbine components. You'll have this, um, this heat-resistant ceramic coating. A lot of blades are hollow. They'll actually make them in a type of a mold where it molds the blade as kind of a shell, and there's internal uh, baffling inside. So if you take one turbine blade and you look at it very carefully, it's almost like a scaled-down airplane wing. It's got the airfoil shape. It's got structure internally and lots of voids. And then what they'll do is they use lasers and they'll bore, they'll bore holes right through it with lasers, and then that'll be set up to, to accept bleed air from the compressor. So there's a constant flow of bleed air going through the blades for internal cooling. And they call it airflow cooling. Um, let me find an image of that because there's not as many images in this textbook as I'd like for these things. So um, And you guys are welcome to do this on your own in your own self-study. Right? Take a look at... This is just a black and white image. That's an image. This is the real deal here and here. Okay, so the concept... If you look, this is the blade itself. It has kind of a fir tree root, but it's really open on the bottom. And so cooling air is piped in through the center, and it goes through this blade. And so if we were to cut that in half, you can see that it's in different chambers here. And so they'll make that air swirl through the blade, right? And then it exits out at the tip. Some of that air is directed just to the leading edge, and it exits out the front of the leading edge through holes. Some of it goes to the trailing edge, and it exits out of holes on the trailing edge. And so you see... These scallops here are kind of like jet nozzles, and so air is blasting out of those at high pressure. You have cooling holes in these different locations. That's that's pretty um, pretty elaborate process. If we take this blade and cut it and look up here on the very top, you see how it looks kind of like an airplane wing? It has those different chambers internally. Okay, Here's another kind of image that shows very similar arrangement. You know, this is a, kind of a standard blade here. This is what it looks like on the outside. But then when they put all the cooling system in the cooling holes, it looks like this. So a real image of one of these is right here. And so, you know, that blade is probably only this big. And those holes are very precisely drilled in with lasers. Okay. So how much does a blade like that run? you got to go buy one. It's going to be 50, 50, 60 bucks? So an individual blade on a turbine wheel, depending on the aircraft size, shape, complexity, all that, let's take something very simple, a PT-6. A PT-6, the smallest turbine with its 23 blades is 64000 bucks. Okay, that's a low-performance engine that doesn't use cooling like this. Okay, so you're looking at... You know, three, four, five thousand bucks a blade. Okay. Well, think of the exotic alloys. Think of all the processes it has to go through, all the inspection, all the quality control. Just the equipment itself to manufacture this is going to be millions of dollars. Yes. Well, more expensive engine. I don't even want to get into it, right? Um, the Airbus, let's see, which one is it? Airbus A380 uses the Rolls-Royce Trent engine. The fan blades, and they're not even turbine blades, they're just the fan blades, so they're in the cold air. They're inflated titanium blades. They actually heat up the titanium and they inject nitrogen in there and it, it puffs it up like a, like a Cheeto or something, right? Those things are something like 30, 36,000 a piece, a blade. Wow, that's a lot. And so this is a little bit better image. 
But we could definitely see... And look also at the holes. There's different angles on those holes also. Right? They come in at different angles and it's all engineered. So you want to be an aeronautical, aeronautical engineer, you have a lot of work cut out for you. Look at the tip. See how this is hollow? This is not a flat machine tip. So how would we classify this tip? This would be called the squealer tip. Remember we talked about that? So this one has been machined out, so this is referred to as a squealer tip. Okay, so most turbine blades are going to be open around the outer perimeter of the wheel, but a lot of them are shrouded. We looked at those images already. So the shrouding, remember the term shroud just means to cover, yeah? So something is shrouded in secrecy. You know, the government's hiding the fact that we have aliens working in the Pentagon. Whatever. <laughs> right? Or you put a shroud over you to cover you. So, it's really a band around the outer perimeter of the wheel. It improves efficiency, reduces vibration. Um, it actually allows the blades to be slightly lighter in weight overall because we could use fewer blades because we have more efficiency. Um, but the blades themselves individually are heavier. Um, but it reduces the turbine speed because of centrifugal forces. And um, it's going to require more blades in an entire section overall. So you have multiple wheels. So there's trade-offs. You know, engineers look at things and they're like, hey, what's better? Front-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive. You know, automatic transmission, manual transmission. Shrouded blades, unshrouded blades. just depends on the application. Okay, when we look at a turbine assembly... The turbine assembly is going to start off with an outer case, okay, typically called the turbine housing. And then in that turbine housing, you're going to have the stator assembly. If this is the first stage stator, that would be referred to as your nozzle diaphragm or your turbine nozzle. A lot of times you're going to have a small spacer between the stator and the blades. Okay, so that spacer ring would be installed. Or depending on how this is engineered, on this particular one, because these are open blades, this might be an abradable ring that goes around the blades. So it's called shroud ring or shroud segment. It's not a shrouded blade. It's a separate shroud. So on a PT6s, when you take the PT6 apart and you pull the turbine wheel out, you're going to have all these individual little shroud segments that you have to number and put in the right order and orientation. And that's shown here by a single ring. The housing itself has a flange on it, obviously, so it can be bolted to the engine, right? So these are all bolted in, in chunks and sections. What's interesting is when they make engines like this, you take two different uh, engines of the same model but maybe a different dash number, and you'll notice that one engine is slightly longer than the other. And if you look at it, you're trying to figure out the differences. Everything looks identical, but when you get to the turbine section, there will be one more of these rings in there. So they just add a stage, right? Um, so these engines are truly modular that way. Okay, last part of the engine. So we're out of our turbine section. Now the gases have to go out the exhaust. So, the exhaust section on a subsonic engine, all the components are fixed in shape, but they are adjustable to some extent. Okay, um, we'll talk about this in engine performance. But on old engines, on older engines, the outer exhaust cone was manufactured longer than it needed to be. And so when you would put the exhaust cone on the engine and you would run the engine, you would not have as much performance as you would expect. And what's happening, it all has to do with Bernoulli's principle. The longer the exhaust cone, the more tapered it becomes and the smaller the, the opening. If the opening is too small, the velocity of the gases coming out comes out too fast and it creates a shock wave. And so what you would have to do is you would take the tail cone, put it on, run the engine, get performance numbers, and then you would take the tail cone off and you would actually cut material off of it to open up the nozzle. You would trim it. That's where the term, the term engine trimming comes from. 
in automotive, you know, we're going to adjust our engine. We're going to tune it, right? We're going to tune it. We're going to put it on the dyno. In turbine engines, they always say we're going to trim the engine. Trimming is a way of performance monitoring and adjusting. That comes from the term of physically removing metal from the exhaust cone because that's the only way to change the performance of the engine was to change the exhaust cone shape. Okay? But there's two cones on the back. There's an inner cone and an outer cone. The inner cone used to be movable on, on early engines and they used that as a way of adjusting the port shape. But that became problematic because it's in the hot gas pan. So if you're trying to make something movable, that means you have to be able to unbolt it or, or you know, hold it in place and then occasionally unbolt it. Any bolt that's in the hot gas path has lots of problems with seizing and corrosion and erosion. Um, they're very expensive bolts. They're very brittle bolts because of the materials they make them out of. So it became actually a little less practical to do that. So you don't see that very often anymore. Um, but when we look at the cones, and we're going to look at an image here, which is going to help you make sense of all this. When we look at the inner cone and the outer cone and the relationship of those two together, what we're attempting to do in the exhaust is to create a diffuser. Okay, right out of the turbine wheel, we want a diffuser. Now, this is kind of counterintuitive. You think, well, I thought we want to accelerate gases, so we should have a nozzle. But before we accelerate them, we have to stabilize them. Because what did the gases just do? They went through a whole series of turbines, which we have veins and blades and veins and blades, and we have impulse blading and reaction blading. So coming out of the turbine wheel, it can be somewhat turbulent. Turbine turbulent. Okay. So the first thing that we want to do is we run it into a diffuser, which is going to stabilize the airflow by slowing it down, allowing it to kind of homogenize, and then the pressure is going to build slightly. Now that we've done that, Let's direct it through a nozzle. So by directing it through a nozzle, what happens to flow? Velocities go up. And then that's how we get the thrust out of the tailpipe. So in order to hold these parts in position, we'll have support struts internally in the engine. A strut is just like an arm to hold something. Okay? And radial means that they're coming from the center going outward, right? Like the, the spokes on a wheel. So one thing that they did with these early engines is since they had radial support struts there, they would make them aerodynamic in shape and they would use them to help redirect the gas flow. So they would be kind of curved. And then finally, we have an outer cone which makes a convergent nozzle and that's to accelerate gases. Okay, let's go to the images. Okay. So, if we take this guy here and we look at it, this is the inner cone I'm talking about. If you look in the back of an engine, you'll see something like this in the middle. Okay. The reason for that, first of all, is remember how a, a turbine wheel is made? The blades are out here. So, air is going past the blades. There's no air coming through this part of the turbine. This is the disc. So, in the back of the disc, it's going to be supported by a bearing assembly, and typically we're going to have to have an oil system back here to lubricate that bearing. So, oftentimes, this right here is a strut. You're going to have oil piping going through the strut, going into the bearing, and then you're going to have an oil drain going through this strut so you can collect the oil to lubricate that. Now, to house all of that, we put a cone around it to protect it, and then that creates its aerodynamic shape. So we see this on the back of the engine. We'll see all the turbine blades through here, right? This is an oil system. More than, more than likely, there's oil going through these. Okay. Now, if you look at the duct from here to right here where my hand is, is it getting bigger? Starts off small and it gets bigger. That's our diffuser. So the inner cone is curved to make a diffuser. This is to stabilize airflow. The problem with this image is they didn't quite get it right. It needs to be a little bit longer. Because from this point right here, the exit of the diffuser, to this point where it comes out of the, the engine exhaust, it should go from big to small. That makes it what shape? A nozzle. 
So our engine exhaust duct is a flipped Venturi. Right? It's an inverted Venturi. So instead of having first a nozzle, then a diffuser, it has first a diffuser, then a nozzle. Two more minutes. Don't go anywhere yet. Um, take a look at this guy. This is looking into the tail end of an engine. So we see now, it's pretty obvious why this cone is here. You know, the, the gases are coming out of this area. Now, look at the strut. Do you see any curvature on that strut? They're curved. So they actually help to redirect airflow. They cause a little bit of a twist to that airflow because coming out of the turbine, it's coming out at a slight angle. So then when it flows past these struts, it helps to smooth that airflow. So now, this section right here, from the tip of this cone to the wall, about right here, that's our diffuser section. And then from there outward, it narrows down to a nozzle. Now, if I stood far away from the engine, you would see that the nozzle shape, but I wanted you to get details, so I stuck the camera almost in the tailpipe to take this picture. Yeah, that, it's outside in the shop. Notice this out here. What's around the perimeter? Okay, so right here, there's a little flange and a bolt. A flange and a bolt. You can see the flange right here really good, and then a bolt and a flange and a bolt. All of those have nothing in them. But what about the one at 1 o'clock? See there's a piece of sheet metal that's kind of bent outward? Yeah. It slid into the flange, and the bolt is holding it in place. It's as if someone kind of dented that exhaust nozzle. It's like squeezing it in. So instead of physically trimming metal away from the engines, that was very early on, they came up with a system where you could install these little protrusions, which effectively reduced the nozzle diameter. So the more of those we add, the smaller the nozzle diameter gets. Guess what they call them? They're called mice. Like a squeak, squeak with whiskers, like a mouse? They're called mice. Who come up with these names? I don't know.